do is launch the all new 2020 Shelby GT500. And we brought this car in here to kind of do a little comparison and a walk around as one of the groups when we go through it. But what I, the engineering men and women of Ford Performance would tell you that this is not your grandpa's 67 GT500. That car in and of itself was, you know, from the ads that Carol used to do, the Le Mans inspired, you know, 428, you know, a couple of 427, big straight line. It had um, straight line power, but really wasn't a road course car. What you're going to experience today is what this 2020 Shelby GT500 is all about, which is the fastest production Mustang we've ever done not only on a straight line, but on a road course. Fastest production Mustang, left and right, and straight line. And what we want you guys to experience today is both of those activities. So we will have the drag strip section and the road course section. And we are really looking forward to you guys' opinions about what you feel about this car. So this group this morning is comprised of some media and friends of, of Ford. Um, how many of our, our folks here are media? Okay, and then I, what I wanted to talk about is we had a special opportunity to do this this early. And I want to be very clear, I think we talked about it with Scott and Natasha when they were talking to you. Driving impressions are embargoed until 6 a.m. Tuesday morning, Eastern Standard Time. We've had our media drive from starting Tuesday through today. Um, and what we want to do is allow everybody to prepare their stories, their pieces of information. So like you guys coming here today, we want you to have the ability to prepare your stuff just as the people who came in on Tuesday. So pictures of a car, like what you'd see in an auto show, revving the car, that type of stuff, people driving by in it, all good. Driving impressions, like what you feel and how amazing that 2.65 liter Eaton supercharger made you feel. Those type of driving impressions, if we could hold off until Tuesday morning, 6 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. And if you kind of come around the car and we'll kind of talk a little bit about this, um, if you think about what Carol started doing, right? 57, Le Mans champion, as a driver, he is still the only human being on the planet to have been able to win as a driver, as a team owner, and as a manufacturer. Um, I joke around with Henry Ford III, who ran Ford Performance Marketing a bit, that he might be the only other human on the planet that could do that because you know his family owned the car they managed the car and then the only thing that he'd have to do is actually drive to win and he's probably not ready to time to take that on but back there in 57 when he was driving and then into the 60s um and the car is actually on display right now at the heritage center was the daytona coupe what year did they win 64 well the championship was 65. 65. yep and he went out there in the daytona coupe um, and one then as a team, as a manufacturer. About, eh, I don't know, along that time, 62, 63, Ford Motor Company and Lee Iacocca and the Fairlane Committee were looking for a vehicle that the, could attract the baby boom generation, we didn't call it that at the time, who was coming back from World War II, who wanted to go out there and enjoy their freedom in a very sporty car. And they started working on that concept. The first one we drove, um, it was the concept Mach 1 Mustang that we drove was out at Watkins Glen. And who was the driver of that one? He went out and drove as the pace car. Um, from that time, it evolved into what we launched on April 17th of 1964 that became the Mustang. Now that Mustang at that time was not a race car. It was not intended to be a race car. In fact, we had two GT versions of the Mustang when we started, and that was more grand touring than it was the GT that we think of today. About July, August of 64, Lee Iacocca went to Carol and said, hey, can you make this Mustang a race car? And Carol came back and he's famously quoted as saying, you can't make a racehorse out of a mule. 
And then what did he and his team end up doing? They ended up building that GT350. The second car produced was the competition model. And that car went on to win SCCA Production B, both in 65 and in 66. So what Carol did was took that Mustang, which was that touring car, you know, that fun little sporty car, and gave it its racing bona fides. Now, that car didn't have AC, radio, anything along that lines. Um, it turned left and right extremely well. Probably wasn't known as a drag strip car. GT500 became like the upper end of the Shelby nameplate. It wasn't out there to go left and right. So this is the car that started the GT500 craze that went from 67 through 70. And then when we brought it back from 2007 through 2014. So there's kind of been two generations of the GT500. Um, within the generations, there were different body styles, engines. You know, we went from 5.4 iron block to 5.4 aluminum block to 5.8 aluminum block. And it went from 500 horsepower all the way up to the 662 horsepower. That was the 2013 and 14. Now those cars, they could go left and right. We did media launches where they went and we took them to road courses, but predominantly they were about straight line speed. The 1314 was certified at over 200 miles an hour. The 2020 Shelby GT500 is the fastest production Mustang we have done, not only on the road course and on the drag strip, but fastest zero to 60, and fastest quarter mile we've ever done. And we'll kind of go through the technology after a little bit here on the back side of it. So I wanted to kind of highlight where we started. So in the front half of this, I wanted to talk a little bit about Mustang over the 55 years. A lot of people would look at Mustang and say, okay, the muscle car era was the 60s. That was the time that it was the greatest muscle car era and what I'm here to tell you is that's not the case. Today is the best time to be a performance enthusiast in the muscle car segment and specifically within the Mustang itself. In the 2020 model year, we will have nine performance production options. And it, it goes all the way from the EcoBoost, which we'll go through, all the way up to the Shelby GT500, but nine different performance packages. That is more than we ever did in the 60s combined. So if you have a taste or a flavor for performance, the Mustang has an option for you. Now, the performance vehicles are selling extremely well. 7% increase year over year. And if you think about that, we've been on this platform since 2015. It is now 2020 and the performance demand year over year, 7% more for GT350 and Bullet in the 19 model year. So our Bullet, 480 horsepower, 420 foot-pounds of torque. It has the V8 engine and then took the throttle body in from the GT350 to get that extra horsepower. It is a great representation of that iconic chase scene that they did in San Francisco going airborne down over the, over the hills. So this vehicle is in the showrooms in 19 and the 20 model years, and it is a limited production, but we don't cap the volume to, you know, to the numbers like the GT350 and GT500. We have had more than 25% greater worldwide demand than what we forecasted. Come back over here, our Shelby GT350. This happens to be the R flavor of it. Most of you have actually had an opportunity to drive it. 526 horsepower, 5.2 liter, naturally aspirated, as Carol would say, as God intended, um, with a flat plane crank that has a red line of 8,250 RPM. In 2020, the Shelby GT500 has that dual clutch transmission, right? A lot of customers, myself included, still love the third pedal. So what we have for the first time in 50 years, since 1970, we will have the GT350 and the GT500 in the dealerships at the same time. If we come over here, our Shelby GT500, 
So if you want to come around here, first, this is not how we want you to end up parking your car, right? Now, this is not how we want to do it here. But what we wanted to do is a lot of people don't get to see the underside and the engineering parts and how they fit together. So if you come back here on the back side of this, and we'll start with the front, has all the coolers, the splitters, the belly pan, the underwing, the wheel liner cooler. And as you can see in the undercarriage here, these aren't just pretty, <laughs> right? Because that's not what you need on the underside of the car. They're functionally designed to draw the air in through to the wheel well to help the cooling on there. So what you'll begin to see is on the underside, when we went through it, the aero package at the Charlotte high-speed wind tunnel with rolling road, we went through with the engineers and developed the undercarriage as well as the above aero to balance the coefficient of drag, cooling, and downforce that is necessary to make it the fastest production Mustang ever. Road course in there. You can see underneath here the DCT transmission, the exhaust, the 16 and a half vented rotors, the Brembo calipers, the Michelin tires, although you can't see the Michelin on here. Um, but what we wanted you to get an idea is an opportunity to see all of those components that you don't get to see when the car is on all four wheels. I um, want to take this time to really talk about the partners, the strategic partners that Ford Performance works with. Um, there are a lot of vehicle integrated engineering with these strategic partners. And I'll start out first with Michelin. On the GT500 carbon fiber track package, they have the Michelin Pilot Sport Cup twos. I like to describe it this way. It is unique cookie dough that you put in the pan and a unique pan that you pull the mold in. And Michelin worked closely with the engineers for that tire compound and that tread and size to deliver a vehicle that literally when we were doing line lock demonstrations this week, we were burning holes in the cement before we had to replace the tires. And there's an NHRA like national event next weekend and the drag strip folks aren't really happy with us because we're gonna have to replace the pad between now and next Saturday. Um, but those partners at Michelin work extremely close with us. There's another partner that you can see here and we'll talk a bit about Brembo, which is designed this over the 16 and a half inch rotor because when you have 760 horsepower and zero to 60 and under, well, mid threes, um, and a quarter mile car that, you know, sub 11s, um, you need to be able to stop that. And you need to be able to stop it repeatedly. And working with Brembo, we did that. Carbon Revolution, and we'll talk a little bit about the wheels here. Carbon Revolution makes the only pre-title certified carbon fiber wheels, not only for GT350R, Ford GT, but now the carbon fiber track package. Eaton, which we can't see as the supercharger, we'll talk about that in a, in a second. Recaro, who builds the seats in there that are fully FMVSS certified for safety, yet provide you that lateral support when you're pulling 1.3 and 1.4 Gs coming into the turns. Recaro is a partner as well. So those are some of the partners that we have. And we wanted you to kind of see underneath the car and how, how it kind of works. This is what we call track precise. Billy Johnson, who drove in our GT4 program, was one of our lead development drivers on here. And when you talk about weight that you want to save, um, I have a dad bod, right? The best weight for me to lose is right here, right? Right in the midsection. The best weight for a car to lose is unsprung rotational mass. So if you think about it, unsprung rotational mass, one of the biggest things that you have in there is your wheel and tire combination. So we have two different packages, if you will, the carbon fiber track package, and then the standard vehicle with the handling package. And what I'd like is one of you to come over here, come on over here. What I'd like you to do, hold this. That's not very heavy, is it? No. Okay, we'll put that back on over here. Now come on over here to this side. <laughs> you have it? Yes, I have it. Okay. All right. So there's a couple things in here. It saves more than 50 pounds, closer to 59 pounds, going from the aluminum to the carbon fiber. 
another really cool thing that Carbon Revolution did is we went up there and we said, okay, love that 19 GT 350R wheel that's 19 inches in circumference, but what we'd like you to do is make it 20 inches, make it five millimeters wider and keep it the same weight. And they did that. They were able to accomplish that task. So this wheel weighs the same as the GT 350R in its 19 inch size. Now, when we talk about unsprung rotational mass, can I, can I borrow somebody yeah. from my audience again? All right, what I want you to do is take your finger and start to spin it. Okay, feel the pressure that you have to do to do that? Yeah. Now take that same exact pressure okay. and spin this. Okay. Do you see how much faster that's spinning? Yeah. That lower weight and lower inertia allows it to actually spin faster, which means it is better weight to lose. So now if we want to come over here, and this is not a reflection of Michelin, our partner today. Goodyear was what was run on the 67 through 70 Shelby GT500. Um, so this is the wheel off of the 1967 Shelby GT500. If you come over here on the other side, I have put up here and mounted, well actually Crawford did, put up here and mounted the 16 and a half inch rotor that is on the 2020 Shelby GT500. If you look at this outside diameter of this rotor and you look at the outside diameter of the wheel, the rotor exceeds the size of the wheel. Now, those drivers back in the 60s era Mustang were far better athletes than we are today. If you had to take it at 120 miles an hour side by side, with another driver and be driving on a wheel that isn't as big as the rotor we're putting in. And if you look at the rotor and the caliper, it's almost the same width as the wheel and tire of the 67. That is some of the innovation and technology that has grown from the 60s all the way to 2020 that helps make the car not only faster, but provide that confident feel for the driver. So again, some of the innovation and technology that we call track precise that has been engineered into this vehicle. If you come up over here, we have some of the suspension components that go in there, including the cutaway of the Magna Ride. That Magna Ride can change the suspension setup from when it, your car feels the rumble strip that you go over on your front right wheel and make the adjustment in the suspension by the time your back right wheel goes over it. It sends an electric charge through a fluid that has metal, part, metal particles in it that is calibrated through the computer, through the brakes, the supercharger, the suspension to actually deliver the absolute best traction that you can have coming out of that turn. If we go back to the rotor piece, we kind of bring both of them out here for a section. You can see it's a two piece center on hub. And what it is here, when you take out this little pizza pie slide, you can see how that sits on the peg. And what that allows it to do is as the heat builds up, it allows it to separate without changing the percentage of the swept area that's under the pad. And with the new Brembo caliper, we have 25% more surface area for stopping than we had on the GT350R. Again, lightweight structural material, the cross tower member, you look at this thing and you're like, oh my gosh, it's gonna be you know my shoulder press exercise. Here, grab this. Oh! <laughs> Isn't that amazing? You can yeah. do your shoulder presses yeah. on there? Again, providing torsional rigidity that allows you to have that suspension set up that you want without adding the weight. And then our steering knuckle, uh, front suspension steering knuckle. Um, one of the things that we learned while we were developing the GT500 that we actually then put into the GT350 is a higher steering knuckle that had a little bit lighter weight and more stability. And what that allowed it to do is actually when you're driving on the road and you have these super soft tires and you're actually feeling it <coughs> grip like one of the, the grooves in the road and it kind of pulls you, this takes that away 
so that you can continue to drive straight when those ruts are there because of the angle of the geometry. It also improves on the track time as well for centering. So all of these are what we have put into the car that we call track precise. 5.2 liter cross plane crank with a 2.65 liter Eaton supercharger. Now, if you remember how much time before Car Crawford, like 13 minutes ago, I told you that our EcoBoost 2.3 liter developed 332 horsepower. This is 2.65 liters bolted on 5.2 liter engine that puts up to 12 pounds of boost in there. We've got a bigger displacement supercharger than we have in our four cylinder Mustang that, that does 332 horsepower. That is an Eaton based, another one of the partners that we worked with um, in developing it. And it sits lower in between the V8. And on the cutaway, what you'll end up being able to see is it sits lower in there so that the arrow under the hood can still work for downforce and coefficient of drag. But that engine in and of itself developing 760 horsepower and 625 pound feet of torque. This is the heart and soul of how we deliver that 760 horsepower to the wheels through the gears. If you think about it, a manual transmission, which I enjoy driving, it's a lot of fun. Gary Patterson is an exceptional driver. When he pushes in his left foot and he goes and grabs for the gear, that can take seconds. And if he's off just a bit on where the RPM is that he actually wanted coming out of that 60 degree right hand turn, he's going to lose precious seconds and time getting back into that acceleration, right? Because when you come out of the turn, slow in and fast out, you want to be able to get back to that speed. The DCT with Tremec that we developed with the Ford Performance Engineers shifts, no kidding, in a blink of an eye. Less than 100 milliseconds, it's 80 milliseconds that this thing can shift in to put you in the exact RPM and throttle position when you're going into it, when you're coming out of that apex to continue that speed through the fastest line on there. So a lot of people will sit there and say, oh, well, why didn't you have a manual transmission in this car? We developed this vehicle to be the fastest production Mustang ever on a road course and a drag strip. And we, we weren't mated to any specific powertrain. Carol would say in the videos, Carol Shelby is my name and performance is my business. He didn't sit there and say, Carol Shelby is my name and manual transmission performance is my business. Right? What we wanted to do is get the absolute fastest vehicle that we could on the road course and this uniquely designed Tremec 7-speed dual clutch was how we delivered it. If we come over here, we have our, some of our other mechanical components associated with it. Um, in the oil pan, as you see, one of the things in here you see are the flaps that allows the oil to go and it's not like high-tech whiz-bang, right? Hey, when you go left, at 1.2, everything's gonna be swinging in here, and this hinge swings open so that the oil can flow through. Not a high-tech piece, but something that allows that car to continue to have the oil in the pressure that you need. We have the piston up here as well that you can kind of see on there that from a weight standpoint, it hasn't changed much. A um, Little bit more robust than the 5.2 liter for the flat plane crank, um, because you needed a little bit beefier componentry to actually you know, take that extra almost 150 horsepower across it. Um, I was explaining on the Eaton Supercharger before. If you wanna come over here, look at the size of the blades that you have in there and look how low they sit so it's below the V8 so that the weight isn't as high up. If you see some of the old Superchargers, like Whipple, Kenny Bell, they sit up high and the blades are on top. Here, the blades go down below so that spinning weight is actually lower. So it allows that to actually perform better to get to the 760 horsepower and then perform once you have that 760 horsepower better laterally on the road course. Now you need the arrow to be able to put that to the ground. So if you walk over here, you know, this isn't a car that you can go to your dealership and order. <laughs> this isn't one that's going to be sitting on a dealer's lot waiting to sell. This is our arrow buck and we brought it out here not because it's pretty. 
We brought it out here to demonstrate some of the innovation and technology that allowed us to develop this Mustang in a much faster time frame. So if you look at this, the technology that's come up is what we call 3D printing, right? So when the designers go through and, do we have the, the arrow, the one with the little pretty color pictures? Sorry, on the other side, here we go. Come on over here. So when we go through on this, we do basically four cycles, if you will. First, the computer sits there and says, okay, if you do all this stuff, here's how the air is gonna move. And that's kind of see where you go and see the colors. Then you take it to the slow speed wind tunnel that we have in Detroit and you put smoke into a little wand and you blow it through there to kind of see whether the air goes where the computer thought it would go. Okay, that all works. Now you take it down to the track, right? See where it goes on the track? Then you take it to the high speed wind tunnel that's down in Charlotte with the rolling road. It's 200 mile an hour. And then you kind of see, okay, we saw it on the track. Does it hold up at those speeds? Previously, when you'd make a change or something that wouldn't work, you'd have to go out and retool a part. That could take weeks and to make a small minor change. So what you were able to do with 3D printing, and I'd really like, you know, when, if you get a chance, come up here and feel this part. You could 3D print a part with the change, put it on there and test it to see if what you were changing and what you saw actually made the difference that you wanted. So if you think about the amount of time that it would take to tool apart and you can compress that into a smaller period of time, the gains in performance over the same time period are greater. And they did this all throughout the car, which is why we have the aero buck here. This is a 3D printed part. What they did is they were widening this. This is an early one to see what the splitter wicker change would do to the arrow pattern. You see, this isn't the standard hood, right? You don't have riveted stuff on your Shelby GT500, but what they wanted to do was test the air that they needed to get through for cooling, over the top for coefficient of drag, and how big did they need to do it? So if you feel this part here, in here as well, that is a 3D printed part. And you notice it's not the same pattern that the car we ended up with. What we wanted you to do is be able to see the differences that we were able to do with 3D printing technology that could, in the same time period, mean we could leapfrog our performance gains. Now, if you want to come back over on the back side, we did it as well. Normally, we don't have 200 mile an hour tape on our cars that, we, you know, that we're selling to the public. But if you see this picture, this piece here, this is one of the 3D printed parts. And if you notice, it doesn't have the same gap up above as the gurney flap that's on the car. What we learned through the testing allowed us to develop these three wings. This is the wing that comes on the standard car. Now, this is the wing that comes on the handling package, which is what we call a gurney flap on here. If you see the difference here on the gap above it, it's very small ended up being this large, almost an inch above, that generates 397 pound-feet of downforce at the back. Probably not something you want to drive when you're daily driving, so it is removable with tools so you could drive it on the street and then customize it and take it out to the track if you want. And then finally below, which we didn't do on this, this wing is the GT4 wing done in carbon fiber to position so you can adjust it based off of the track that you're going at that can generate up to 550 pound-feet of downforce. You still have to make sure that the cooling comes in. So what we've done here is cut away the front nose of all of the cooling and the air that has to flow through that comes out of our six square foot air extractor underneath the hood. Now, that comes up with a standard with a pan, a rain tray pan for your normal daily driving. Because when you want to go to the, your cars and coffee on Sunday, you don't want to actually have all the rain and all the stuff under your hood. There's a rain tray that's in there. In the supplemental owner's guide and the kits that are going to the owners, we explain in what situation and what combination you want to operate these. But when you're on the track, basically, you want to have the rain pan out. But you can see here, along the wall over there, what you can see here is the various surface areas 
that have for cooling across the board. And what we did is we cut out some of the pieces so that you could see where the airflow has to go. That is the Shelby GT500 and all the magic that makes it work. So you've seen the powertrain, the suspension, and the aero and cooling that makes this car the fastest production Mustang on the road course and on the drag strip. Thank <laughs> you.